everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learning with Bell Vista Studios. The intent of Learning with Bell Vista Studios is for us to speak to other people in the industry who inspire us, who we want to learn from, and that help us be better at what we do as learning designers. So in today's episode, I am so excited. We have John Hinchcliffe here. And John is a very good friend of mine. We met in London and he was very generous to show me everything L&D in London, introduce me to the L&D community. He has had such a big impact on the L&D community. I've actually, I had a look and the amount of awards that John has won is honestly out of control. So he's a multi-award winning digital learning professional. Some of the awards, just to name a few, is he got the Learning Give Back Award. He was named one of the top 30 thought leaders in the e-learning industry. He was also named a top, a top marketing leader. Um, and he has just like started so many communities and had such a big impact on people in the community. So to have him here today, we are just so excited. He has so much value to share. So everyone watching or listening should be super, super excited. I remember when I met John in London, we had a conversation where he said he wanted to become the most helpful guy in L&D. And since that conversation, just the impact that I've seen him have is just like he has 100% embodied that. And I think he should be so proud of the impact that he's had. Um, so thank you for coming along, John, and giving us your time to share with our community. Goodness, thank you very much for having me in such a um, such a lovely introduction. Well, good. All right. So this episode, what we're going to be talking about is, so there are certain skills that help us be learning designers and succeed in our industry. But what we wanted to explore in this episode is other skills from other industries um, that can help you in your career as a learning designer. So things beyond the learning designer sort of sphere. Um, John has done so many other things, like just a few of the things is he's built so many connections online, he shares videos, he's mentored others, he's run group meetings, and he's also founded L&D communities, and that has helped him to have the impact that he has in the industry. So I think it'd be really cool to explore some of those additional skills that you have, John. Um, so others can be inspired and have a look at what else they might want to learn as learning designers to help them prosper in their career and do well in their career as learning designers. So my first question was, so you, you were named a top marketing leader. So I wanted to know what marketing skills did you learn and how did it help you in your role? Yeah, so I mean, that was a real shocker for me because I never really considered myself as a marketer, but really when I think about it, I think it's very much as looking at ourselves as a personal brand. You know, I think that was a really big element that I saw in myself, um, you know, reading books like, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk and things like that, just understanding that you and your presence online is very much a personal brand. And it doesn't matter if you're not looking for a job now, it's amazing how people remember you two years down the line, three years down the line for the things that you post and how helpful you can be. And so for me, it was really being intentional about what I was doing with my LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn for me is a massive, massive thing. I mean, goodness, I practically live there. But for me, I remember I had, goodness, maybe 1,000 connections. And I was annoyed and it's one of those things with social media where you have that jealousy and those kinds of things, and you're annoyed that you're not getting more attention. Why am I not getting more likes? Why am I not getting more you know, interactions? Why am I not doing as well as these people? And then I actually paused and had a look. And I looked at it and I was thinking, well, when was the last time I actually posted? When was the last time I actually brought people value? Instead of just saying, oh, I think this is really good. Great. That's a wonderful opinion to have, but what value are you really bringing people? And so I just got really intentional about bringing a lot of value, but without the expectation of anything really coming from it, just that mm -hmm. give, 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 give. And it's really for me, you know, when I look back and I look at the amount of time that I actually spend outside of work on that, it is 
pretty wild. So, I mean, it's evenings, it's weekends. It's when you're down at Starbucks coffee and you've got the Canva mobile app on your phone and you're making posts. Mm. It's that kind of dedication. And so for me, it was looking at how could I be a little bit different from everybody else? So, I mean, one of the things was uh, once it Wednesday. Once it Wednesday was a really bizarre idea because it came from the Ice Bucket Challenge. And the reason the Ice Bucket Challenge was so kind of prominent and why it got so famous was it put people on notice because people were getting called out. People aren't used to getting called out. But with this, it was that without the ice, without the bucket. But it was you record one tip because we have so many tips within the industry, but we don't know how to share them. So you recorded one tip on your phone, video, and then you nominate two people. And then hopefully they then do a tip, nominate two extra people. In the beginning, it was terrible because I didn't know anybody. And I was asking people who I'd never spoken to to do it. But the people that were doing it started to grow, started to grow, started to grow. And so that helped, you know, really share those personal stories and you know, helpful comments. And you start getting some really cool people on there. Like you had Simon Brown from Novartis. You had Laurie Niles Hoffman from Niles Nolan, you know, and it just starts getting the word out. So the first time I did that, it got a little bit of attention. Mm. Second time I did that after I was actually intentional with my LinkedIn, actually helping people, providing really helpful content, commenting, and actually actively helping people. So mentoring as well. Second time around, I think it hit like a hundred thousand views because mm. it's just that thing of you have to constantly be helping, but without the expectation. And I think that's something that we really dislike on LinkedIn is when you connect with somebody, there is almost that innate fear that within two minutes, I'm going to have them slide in my DMs, mm. hoping it finds me well, where else is it going to find me? Yeah. And then... <laughs> Yeah. And then tell me and try and sell me and let's set up a 15 minute coffee. Mm. I think a way better thing that could be done is take an actual interest in that person. What are they doing? You know, what are their pain points? Offer some free help. Build up that kind of partnership between you both and then ask. Mm. You know, it, is, it is, you know, when we talk about Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, Give, 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 ask. Mm. Absolutely. Rather than ask, ask, ask. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really where it came from. So um, yeah, I mean, I was blown away, but you know, when it comes to marketing, you know, I look at my statistics on LinkedIn. You know, in the past year I've hit close to three quarters of a million views on content, which is unreal. You know, some posts hit fifty thousand views. But wow. another weird thing is, how many things am I actually selling? Mm. Hardly anything. Yeah. So it's provide people value, provide people value. Because another thing is, it's also you displaying what you know. Mm. And this is something that I talk about, you know, when I do mentoring and things like that is people, you know, they want to understand what you know, how you discuss things, how you actually you know, have a concept of what l and is. And social media is a perfect opportunity for you to actually display that. Mm. And the wonderful thing is the barriers to entry are so low. You know, you mm. want to start a LinkedIn channel. All you need is your smartphone. Mm. Actually, all you need is your smartphone. That's it. And you're good yeah. to go. Like, and you it's, can do that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you can just push that out. And then you start, you know, looking into different things about SEO. And especially when it comes to, you know, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a beast because of the algorithm. The algorithm is such a weird and complex thing. But it's about understanding where is your audience? You know, mm -hmm. who is your audience? Where are they? Okay, what time zone is that? When is best to post for that particular time zone? Mm -hmm. Because a massive thing with LinkedIn is, when you post, what's the initial interactions with regard to that? That's going to determine how many views and also just how many people will then interact with it. Mm. So, um, 
so many things to take into consideration but I mean for me it was about being really intentional with that and really looking into just Mm -hmm. how can you provide as much value as possible yeah I love that I think that's really cool because a lot of people do like when you're like in the industry and you're wanting to like succeed and do better like it can be natural to want to ask other people for things so like connecting with people and being like do you have a job for me or like is there anything you can offer me? But I think like a lot of value can come from you figuring out what value you can bring to others. Yeah. Even if it's like you're just starting as an instructional designer and you're like sharing your process of what I've been learning and like yeah. this, is this cool tool that I found. And I think like by adding that value and you've shown it, like you've done it and it's been a long game. Like it's not just like an overnight. Oh. Thing. Like it's a lot of effort that you put in of like adding value to people. But I think like that process, people get to know you. People remember, oh, I remember John. Like I remember he posted that thing that was helpful. And if they ever, for example, like if we were looking for a contract and it was something that you could do, like I would think, oh my God, John, like he was so helpful in London. Like, and you would be on to- on the top of my list. And that was just you being curious about me, adding value to me. So I can totally see how like, yeah, it's just like, how can you add value to others? And it will come back to you. And exactly. it's not what you said, it's not expecting that it'll come back to you, but you'll definitely get your name out there and people will begin to trust you and build yeah. that rapport with you through that environment. So yeah, that's really cool. Good 100%. on like the effort that you put in and like what's come out of it. Like the amount of people that have signed up to the GLDC, but like it just shows I mean, like, the amount of connections you've made, the people that you've met. I think that's so cool. I mean, that was a really incredible thing of, you know, COVID hit. I'd previously been doing face-to-face meetups in Dubai and just learning Zoom. How mm-hmm. weird is that to say now? But I, I learned I Zoom. Now. Well, a lot of people. And, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, learning. Uh, I'm making mistakes. You know, I think that's something that we really need to talk about is it's really, really good to make mistakes. Because yeah. I, at one point of having global and development community, I had seven different platforms on the go. Yeah. I had... MailChimp, Eventbrite, I had a Wix site, I had LinkedIn pages, I had Zoom, goodness, what else did I have? Patreon, and there was something else. And it's just, you make so many mistakes, and then you streamline it down into yeah. just one platform. Yeah. But it's, I mean, GLDC, that was at a point of time, just once again, just helping people. I've lost so much money doing GLDC like that is so honest because it was never the intent to you know make it into something profitable you know I actually talked to people and they were like oh we've got this product maybe you could like sell it to your members and I have to then tell them that in the first week of setting up GLDC I put in a clause that I say on every single meeting there's no selling yeah I was like I can't you can't go against your own word you can't go against your own rules yeah because people remember that you know they really really remember that stuff but um yeah i mean gldc coming up to goodness me that's coming up to its third birthday now wow and that's nearly hit i think three thousand people which is just unreal but it's once again when you think about you know what what was the expectation from that nothing Mm. it grew it grew it grew it was at a point of time when it really grew, where it was out to help so many people. I mean, you know, 120 people turning up on a Friday afternoon just mm. to chat with one another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's another, like the two things I get from that is like, I think a lot of people try to get things perfect before they try. But as yes. big part of our industry, like it sounds like from what you're saying, like just you just need to put things out there and test and experiment and you will get things wrong. But like that's the way to get yourself out there and like start creating change. Like it's not going to be perfect. It's just a process. So I think that's like really cool for people to understand as well. Yeah. I think the thing that I really, really want to push out to people, and it's something that I've had people get in touch with me because I've heard it on other podcasts. I love failure. I love second place, which is really, really odd. Um the best the best learning experience i've had from a professional career so back in 20 
2017, I want to say, it's either 2016, 2017, was the first time I was up for awards. First time. Yeah. And I had the delusions of grandeur that I was up for two awards, two separate awards. I was up for Learn Technologies Designer at Learn Tech Awards and Learning Professional of the Year at the LPI Awards. And I had these silly ideas in my head. I was like, what happens if I'm the first person who wins both awards? Like, oh, what's yeah. my acceptance speech going to be like? I better buy a tuxedo. Yeah. You know, all these weird things. And then it came to both. And I didn't even place in either. I didn't even get third place. Yeah. And it was the best thing to happen to me. Obviously, it hurt at the time. Yeah. yeah. But it was the yeah. best thing because, one, it showed me that there's nothing cool about having an ego. So get rid of the ego. But two, you need to do more. Yeah. You know, this this is the level you're trying to play at. Mm -hmm. So you need to do more. You need to figure out what you need to do more. And so for me, it was then, right, being super intentional, helping people on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. joining the board of directors for the e-learning network. So I was actively engaging with the industry and helping out. Mm. Actually looking at how was I providing ROI through my courses and actually helping organizations. Yeah. You know, and just really working towards that. And then it was like the next year, I won a bronze. The year after that, I won a silver. Yeah. And so you start building up and building up because you're doing more and you're doing more and you're doing more. And then this year, which was a complete shock, I mean, there's a video online of it that's had like, I think, 18,000 views. Yeah. And it's me being announced that I won the Colin Calder Award for Outstanding Contribution to Learning, which is a secret award. You can't put yourself up for it. Wow. Like the, the LPI figure out who is deserved of this. And when you look at people who won it, you know, you've got like Don Taylor, Laura Overton, Josh Burson. Josh Burson has like 800,000 followers. He's like one of the biggest names. Yeah. And then there's my name alongside his on this award. So cool. I saw that video, like the shock on your face. It was so, like, you were like, wait, yeah. what? <laughs> like, you were so yeah. confused. But yeah, I yeah. love that. I love, like, the like the concept of it's okay to fail. Like, failing is good because you learn what you can do differently. And I think in our um, line of work and our career, like, failure is a big part of it. I know I myself, like we don't know everything and there's so many different things that you need to know as a learning designer and so many different like industries that we need to be pulling from and you're not going to get it perfect. Like the amount of times I have failed on things and I've been angry at myself, but I'm learning like each time to get a little bit better around like, it's okay. Like, what can I do differently next time? Yep. And like, we're in the learning industry. Like we're all about learning. So we need to be comfortable with like, okay, we just need to learn more. It's all good. So failure it, is a skill yeah it is it honestly is so that's everyone listening learn to fail and learn to love it because it will get you places just keep failing keep learning and moving forward there you go words to live by yeah exactly all right so you were mentioning so you got the learning give back award as well and that was around your work during the pandemic so connecting people, helping people learn during that time where people couldn't meet up in person. So I was wanting to know, so the world is moving to like online. A lot of people are working from home. A lot of people are on their computers, less face-to-face -face is happening. What advice do you have for people to like build a community or add value to people in that online format? I mean, it's a great question. It's a really, really great question. And we are moving so, so much to digital. You know, I think you really need to put in the effort, but also I think you can put in the effort in two different ways. So understand that the world is very small, you know, especially the L&D world. The L&D world is even smaller. If you want to connect with people, you can do. You know, LinkedIn is a wonderful, wonderful tool, but it's really being intentional and having an understanding beforehand of what do you actually want to do with that connection? You know, what are you needing? Just talking to people. Okay. That's cool. You can have that as kind of part of your stream, if you mm -hmm. will. So maybe there's a social stream, but then understanding what are you wanting to do professionally? Is it that you're wanting to develop your career? Okay. How is it that you're wanting to build up new skills? Is it you wanting to understand from people who are way 
if you're listening on the podcast, quotation marks, bigger mm. than you are in the industry and seeing if you can learn from them. How did they progress their career? You know, mm. what steps have they taken? It might be that you are looking for people who are around the same level as you and you wanting to just see what are they doing? You know, have some harmony, understand their best practices. What are they doing? How could you help each other on projects? You know, how could you bring them value? Yeah. You know, so I mean, those are the kind of things that you can do online. And that's the wonderful thing about social media is it's a numbers game. Okay. Not everybody is on LinkedIn all the time. Okay. So that is something to really remember. Also, some people still have this thing of with LinkedIn, I'm not going to connect with people that I don't know. Mm. There's like 800 million people that are opportunities for you to talk to. Your new best friend could be on LinkedIn. Yeah. Be open. Be open and actively connect with people, but be intentional and understand what also are you wanting to bring to that? So it's not just taking, but it's giving. What do you want to give? Yeah. That kind of social experience. Yeah. In their role or what they're doing. Yeah. Also, try and do face-to-face where you can, because there is just nothing that replaces face-to-face, just that human connection. Cool thing that I'm starting to do, it's really odd. When you go on holiday, find people where you are going on holiday who are in L&D and have a little meetup. Yeah, I love that. So I've done that in Berlin. I've done that in Amsterdam. I'm doing that in Dubai. And it's just really lovely because then you get to see what is kind of going on in L&D in that particular country with that particular person. And it's just, it's so nice because... You know, something that we sometimes struggle with with social interactions is talking about stuff. Mm. But it's that wonderful thing of, okay, I'm on holiday. Let's talk about the things that I've been doing on my holiday. And you yeah. give me recommendations of what there is in your hometown. Great. Mm. You know, and then, you know, you just kind of build that connection and just kind of really work with that. And I think that's something that's so fun and so cool. And it's just something that I really want to try and do throughout my different holidays yeah that's really cool and I love that it like doesn't have to like the way you can build connections doesn't have to be just like learning and development like there can be other things that you vibe with over some like with someone and then through that connection that can lead to future opportunities or like them helping you with a project you helping them with a project like that and I I agree with you with the face-to-face like the online it is good like the social media and the LinkedIn and all of that but even meeting you in real life in London, like I think if we hadn't met in real life, we wouldn't have the connection that we have now. Like it's because we had that time face to face, like building mm-hmm. rapport. We've continued to like catch up and like find out about each other's lives and learn from each other. So yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think it's really cool that you put yourself out there to meet people. You don't, um, cause it's not always like you have to know everything. Like you can meet with people and learn from them. What can you learn from them? You don't have to be an expert. If you're new in the industry, meet with exactly. people, ask questions. What do you want to learn? What do you want to get better at? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's really cool. All right. So are there any other industries that you sort of pull from or learn from that helps you be better at what you do that you wanted to share with people? So we covered marketing. Think- connections you know what the thing that I'm really striving to do better is uh photography well cinematography to be more specific because so we were talking about being inspired being inspired is a critical element of any learning professional you know looking out there not only within the echo chamber of L&D but also looking out there in the wider world and something that's always gotten me is great, just great video. You know, when you see somebody on a webinar and it's just so crisp and it's amazing yeah. and the lighting's fantastic, yeah. it's something that I'm really striving for. So uh, I've invested in a better camera, not yeah. this one. This one's great. I mean, this is a great webcam, but no, the camera is just there to try and take things up a level, just to try and emulate you know, what I'm seeing, what I'm really enjoying, because the fact is we as individuals, we expect a consumer grade experience. Mm. That is the thing with 
no matter what we're doing, you're always basing yourself on your last experience. And the issue mm-hmm. is, and especially when we think about learning and developments, if somebody goes from watching a really great YouTube video, if they watch a Casey Neistat, okay, really great, great storytelling, great videotography, then they go through to your video that you've created for, you know, how to do a particular process. It's a massive jump. Yes. So how are you inspired but also how do you look at what's the technology that you can utilize in order to make that possible make it a degree better yeah you know and that's that's something for me especially when I look at you know user generated content that's a massive thing that is within our industry whereby organizations are doing internal zoom meetings mm-hmm. how do you make it look better yeah you know, how do you get a nice background of canva Put both videos on titles mm-hmm. and it just makes it look better than just two people yeah you know how do you make it branded and it's really simple things like that of just playing with you know canva camtasia yeah just playing and that's a massive thing as well be willing in your spare time to play create yeah. and it's not going to be great you know there are going to be massive failures but it's also you know, you're going to create things and you're going to learn from, mm-hmm. you know, particular elements. So it's like this project I did two years ago on how to do this effect in Camtasia. I've now got a client who wants that in their video. Okay, great. Yeah. Memory muscle, go back into it and start working with it. So yeah. Oh. So for me, marketing, marketing is critical. Yeah. Videotography, that's kind of the big thing for me now. Yeah. And that's where I really want to spend some time, do some great things try and figure out lighting, you know, because that appears to be a massive element. Looks like I'm at a campfire. <laughs> so you can just hold your hands and keep warm. But it is, it is that. And I think, you know, especially in the world of user-generated content, yeah, that is a massive skill to have. So understanding how can you just take things up a level, what's at your disposal, really get deep on Canva. I think Canva is such a fantastic but under discussed like tool yeah like, how you transfer that um other areas it feels like it's the most common thing to talk about at the moment but ai mm. like i'm getting i'm getting deeper into ai but more on the text to speech side interesting why is that like, just i think there's so much that can be benefited from just those learning those skills of what sounds great when it comes to text to speech, because mm-hmm. we have, I think it's is the term uncanny valley, where we're watching the videos of like Synthesia, Colossi, and those kind of things, and the mouth just looks a little bit off. But the thing that I've been seeing with that is. People have been utilizing it on Zoom recordings. You know, at the beginning when you're going through to a conference. Yeah. So a like a Colossian like AI speaker at the beginning, talking wow. through how to make sure you're muted, how to Oh. And it's that's not technically learning, but it's instruction. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at it and I was thinking to myself, people who aren't in this industry are gonna take that as mm. a human person. I was like, it is pretty close. So yeah. it's how can we kind of cross over AI into non-learning elements? Yeah. And I think from an audio perspective, I think text-to-speech, especially, I mean, I, I'll say it like Colossian. I think Colossian's got the best text-to-speech that there is. Like I was listening to a few of their samples and it's so uncanny. Also, you know... If you're on like TikTok or anything like that, there's a lady's voice, an American lady's voice that seems to be on every yeah. single one. Oh, no, She's on that. Oh, so wow. I think okay. Her name's Ramona on the uh, voiceovers. And yeah. yeah, I was playing with it the other day and I was like, this just sounds like a TikTok video. Wow. How cool. Yeah. That's awesome. But I think- love that you can use it for your own personal branding, but then like, that also carries across to clients wanting videos and wanting to do like learning initiatives. And there's so much like crossover, which I think is really cool. 
And you also look at like voiceover, you know, voiceover artists. I've got so much love and respect for voiceover artists because they can bring so much emotion to a particular project. But where a client has a minimal budget, but they need voiceover, Mm. it is a great tool to utilize. You know, if they just need, you know, the standard, they're not really too passionate about, you know, the voiceover being you know super emotive, super, you know, high level, you know, this gives them that kind of base level that they can utilize. And also the turnaround time is minimal. Wow. So, yeah, that's so cool. Not having to like wait for something to be recorded. And yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Something else I saw recently was like it's AI where it can if you're like reading off a script, I don't know if you've seen yeah. it, but it like directs your eyes to the camera. So you could be like looking nice. like this and reading a script, but then like the AI like moves your eyes. So you're looking straight into the camera. And I thought that would be really cool for a lot of clients want videos where they're, they they might have like leadership, like talking and how cool yeah. if they look like they're literally, like they've learned the script and they're looking right into the camera. So that's like another yeah. example. I mean, okay. that, that also is a skill, you know, that being yeah. able to read a teleprompter, I've had to learn that. Hmm. And that's that is a skill. It's learning that tempo. Yeah. But yeah. there are uh apps that will actually take you down the line as it will listen out for what you're talking oh, and will wow. actually move down. Supposedly, like somebody was recommending it to me because I did a course and it was trend, it was the first time I did a full transcript. Yeah. And the amount of bloopers and things that I got wrong was absolutely unreal. And they were saying, you know, there is this thing that will take you down. And so then it goes with your natural kind of speech tempo. Yeah, that's really cool. How awesome. All right. Well, thank you. That was so good. So videography, learning about like how to create cool videos. I think even like little things, even what you've got, we've spoken about it a few times, like the bookshelf behind you. Like just adding that so it's like a conversation starter with clients or stakeholders. It makes your backdrop look really good. Like something as simple as that can have such a big difference. Um, And yeah, I agree with the videography. I think it's so cool. I don't know if you've seen AJ and Smart on YouTube, but I absolutely love the way they're like a um, design thinking company and they do design sprints. But the way they do their videos, like they've got little, they've just got beautiful backdrops. Like it just looks flawless, like cool colors they've got like little pop-ups and yeah that they really inspire me with the way they do videos so yeah that's really cool and then you mentioned ai as well so looking at what sort of ai tools you can use to help with your personal brand help with the learning that you design very cool thank you all right so for to finish up i've got like a rapid fire segment so (laughs) it sounds a bit stressful but it's not (laughs) So I'm going to ask you a question and just give me like the first thing that comes to your mind, like a a quick answer. Um, And it's all around like the skills that have added the most value to you as a learning designer just to help people figure out what they might want to spend time on learning. So the first question is, which skill has saved you the most time as a learning designer? Content curation, without a doubt. Love it. Okay, which skill has helped you wow your stakeholders and clients the most? Presentation skills. So learning from things like Steve Jobs. Mm, So as in how you like present yourself? Yeah, how you present yourself, but also how your slides are different to everybody else and how you bring animation into those. So um, look at things like Prezzo. Yes, love. Prezzo or Prezi? Yeah, Prezi as well. I'll find the link. Yeah. I'll put it in the oh, description. <laughs> Prezi, because I think Prezzo is a chain of Italian restaurants here in the UK. Prezi. <laughs> do do that as well. Do do Prezi and Prezzo. Yeah, Italian's good. If you want to go out for some nice Italian, add that to your list. Yeah. Um, which skill has helped you be prepared for anything that you might face in your career? Oh, that's a good one. That is. Failure. can we call that a skill but i think we can in these kind of contexts like being okay to fail yeah very cool okay if you could acquire one skill right now what would it be these are good questions (laughs) 
oh, this is really making me think. Like I would have automatically gone with videography, but yeah. you know what? I just, one of the things I'm terrible at is sales. Yeah. Like I've always wanted to be a good salesperson. Hey, love. That like I'm, cool. I'm super good at like influencing because I'm always coming from the heart and always like Do being it. super honest. But actually being able to like properly sell stuff, I think that'd be like an amazing skill to have. Love that. I agree. I would love to learn about that more as well. That's a good one. Um, what skill should every learning designer have in order to stay relevant into the future? Curiosity. Thousand percent. Just constantly taste. That's the thing that I talk to so many people about and whether they take it on board or not, it's you have to taste. You have to taste so many different things. Yeah. Find out what works for you. Find out what doesn't work for you. What's right for your budget? What's right for your stakeholders? What's right for your business? What's right for you? You know, so yeah. taste, 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 taste. Don't yeah. spend a ton of money. Just taste because there's so much available out there that's free trials or just YouTube videos and just try things. Yeah, very cool. Love that. All right. Last one is what is the key characteristic of a strong learning designer mindset? You know what? That's changed in my mind so many times. Wow. Okay. Because you you do. I know we're moving away from short, sharp answers on this, but it's that thing of in the beginning, you think it's about just creating, just pushing out. So the thing you need to focus on is impact over output. Yeah. That's the biggie that I've learned. So what we mean by that is output used to just be you received an order you push something out you create a course you don't yeah. think about it you just make mm -hmm. impact is where you're asking more questions so i did a post recently where it was like you know how what where why when how mm -hmm. just to understand from your stakeholders you know what are you needing to create why you know starting out with why kathy moore you know action mapping perfect why do you need this? Why is learning going to be a solution? Is learning going to be the solution? So if it's mm. not, then you're just going to waste time and you're going to create something that's going to have zero engagement. And also yeah. whereby LMD isn't going to get any good words. It's just going to be LMD made this thing. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. So it's impact. Search for impact over output. I think if we can put that into the skill kind of bucket, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love that. I agree because I like I've spent a lot of time on things thinking like I'm going to create this amazing output and it hasn't had the impact that I want. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I could have spent like half of the time creating something that had way big impact, but the output wasn't as much. So I can like 100 percent relate to that. I've definitely learned that lesson myself. All right, well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much, John. There was so many like yeah, amazing little nuggets of information there. So thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything that you'd like to leave the audience with before I wrap up the episode? You've shared so much value already, so it's up to you. I think there's just always these things of please, please, please share what you're doing. You know, I think that's the biggest thing because others need to be inspired. I mean, so much love and appreciation to you and to Bovista for constantly pushing out best practices, what's good, what to look out for, what questions, because, you know, for people who are entering this industry or who've been in for a while, they need that helping hand. They need to understand from others what's working, what's not working. And so just sharing, share your journey, be humble, be open. Yeah. And also work on your personal brand because that is something that is so crucial because you never know when you're going to have to call on it. So yeah. Yeah, those Love are my that. kind of closing words. Love it. Thank you, John. And everyone who is listening or watching, follow John on LinkedIn. John has also released a course as well. Do you want to share what that course is, John, for instructional designers? I think that'd be very helpful. Community. Yeah, absolutely. So I created a course called the Complete Instructional Designer Course, which is on Udemy and also Yumi for Business. Um, we've just surpassed 3,000 learners on that. And a massive thing for me was... There's so many people trying to get into instructional design, 
but a lot were being faced with quite high costs through academies and other particular things. People were paying, you know, $7,000 US dollars in order to join, you know, academies. Um, And for me, that just seemed really bad that people were remortgaging their houses, selling their cars in order to just get skills to hopefully be able to get a job. So I chopped that down from four figures to two figures. Yeah. You know, and just hoping that it helps as many people as possible. So that was the whole intent of it. You know, it's one of the best selling instructional design courses on Udemy. And it's just there to really, really help people. So a lot of great reviews on that. And I think that's the difference between everybody else's stuff that you can see every single review is on there. It's not just like cherry picked five stars. You can see the four stars. It's amazing. So um, it's just being completely transparent and open and just trying to help people. So to build that foundation, yeah, it really, really helps. Awesome. Well, yeah, anyone who who wants to improve their instructional design or wants to learn from John and all of the experience that he has, check it out. I'm going to link it in the description below so you can check out that course. But thank you so much for joining us, John, and giving us your time. We love having you on the show. And thank you, everyone, for listening. What's up, awesome human? Thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of myself and the Bell Vista Studios team for continuously choosing to learn with us. We really appreciate it. If the tips and the insights and the context resonate with you and you want to take your skills to the next level or you want to make your life way easier, you will love our Creator Hub. The Creator Hub is a place for people like you and us, basically, it's the stuff that we use internally at Bell Vista Studios and then we just share it publicly with you. The Creator Hub is created by instructional designers for instructional designers and what you'll love there at the moment is we've got a quiz, Could I Be a Better Instructional Designer, that has so much tips in the feedback if you're interested in human-centered design or just taking your skills to the next level in terms of the solutions you're creating, the problems you want to solve. But in there as well, Aren't we cute? That's us. Um, But we've got the coaching courses, freebies, give us gratitude, and also we've got some templates. And basically, they're always around the lens of learning experience design, instructional design, and e-learning. So a human-centered design focus is very much what we're about at Bell Vista Studio. So putting your learners at the heart of a solution and creating something for their needs. So there's the human-centered design stuff and then we've also got the business stuff. So this is the stuff they don't teach you about when you want to become a freelancer or a consultant in the instructional design world. So go check it out. The link is in the description. You can check out everything that is available for you. Thank you for choosing to learn with us. Continuously invest in your skills. You will be rewarded as an instructional designer share this stuff share it with other people because when we are better instructional designers we create better solutions that create better humans that create a better world so we have a very important role and i'm excited to be on this journey with you have an awesome day